Welcome to the Utility Statewide Codes and Standards Program webinar on our update to our existing single family homes cost effectiveness study. Um, just want to make sure that everybody is informed that we are recording the webinar today and we will be sharing both the recording and the presentation following the webinar with everybody. Again, good afternoon. My name is Misty Bruceri and I'm the coordinator for the uh, Utilities Reach Codes program. I'm here with Ada Shen from Frontier Energy, Aaliyah German also from Frontier Energy, and Jasmine Krauss from Policy Studio. Ada is an engineer at Frontier and she's the lead analyst and one of the primary authors of our study, um, along with uh, support from Aaliyah, of course, you all know Aaliyah. And Jasmine is the policy and data lead on the Cost Effectiveness Explorer development team. Um, thank you both for joining us today. I appreciate it. Um, we have a pretty full agenda today, um, but I think that we should probably be able to have enough that we should have enough time to work through it pretty comfortably. But to make sure that we stay on schedule, we want to ask that for like for those questions that aren't super urgent that can wait, um, we ask that you please. Put those questions in the Q&A. If you have a question that's really hampering your understanding or something like that that really needs to be addressed right away, um, please raise your hand and we'll go ahead and stop the presenter. But for those questions that can, can kind of fold until the end of the presentation, please put those in the, in the Q&A. Okay, and we'll be monitoring that and answering those as we go. So after this introduction, I'm going to turn things over to Ada. And she's going to provide us um, an, an initial overview of all the updates to the study and the major impacts that they're, they're in. Uh, following that, Jasmine's going to walk us through some of the functions in the Explorer and how you can use that tool to help you understand the results better. Um, there's a lot of coaching uh, in the tool, and um, we'd like to show you how that may work for you. Um, after that, we're going to go back to Ada, and she's going to then dive into some of the detailed study results and go through some of those and the impacts that she's discovered. And then finally, back to Jasmine, and she's going to show us how to use those results to create a flexible compliance path policy or another policy in the Explorer tool. So we're going to do a little bit of back and forth there. But before we begin in earnest, um, we really want to let you know that we have heard your feedback. Um, we try our best to present the data in a clear manner, you know, as clear a manner as we can, but we realize also that there is an incredible volume of data and it's somewhat unfamiliar to a lot of people. It can be really overwhelming. And so, you know, while we all understand there's a lot of ground to cover, we also know that a lot of people kind of feel like this by the end of our webinars. And so we're trying to address that today. Um, as I noted, we are always working to try to balance the amount of information and the complexity while trying to actually represent what is a pretty realistic scenario, if we can. Um, so in order to try to achieve a little bit of a better balance today, we made a few changes to try to make the information a little bit more easily digestible. Um, we added a little bit more time to the webinar in case we need it. And as you saw, we're switching up the presentation format a little bit also. Um, all of our studies, we have to cover the entire state, but we realize that you are likely only interested in one or two climate zones for your own jurisdiction. And so um, the Explorer is actually a great tool that cuts through all of that statewide data and will show you only those results that are relevant to your jurisdiction. So that you don't have to go through all those tables and figure out what's what's relevant for you. Uh, so with that in mind, we're going to be featuring the tool today with a focus on using the tool to both improve your understanding of the study and to build a policy. Um, another change that we've made is we've narrowed our focus a little bit on this webinar. Um, we're not going to be talking about the submittal process or specifics of the ordinance language today or any of the other pieces of this process. Um, we've covered that in many previous webinars, um, and we have many resources that you can download to assist that. We have a newcomers webinar series that you can also uh, view to go through some of those things. 
But today we really want to just focus on these two topics. Um, we also know that the study includes both HVAC and water heating equipment replacement measures. Um, and while those are included in the results, today we're going to be focusing mostly on accessing, understanding, and using a, all the results in the Explorer to create a flexible compliance policy, not so much of an equipment replacement policy today. Um, we are going to be scheduling another webinar to cover the AC to heat pump replacement material in the next couple months. Um, in the new study, there's a whole, there's several different scenarios and it's really, it's important to understand how and why they differ and, and the impacts of those differences. So we want to set aside a separate time to talk about that. Okay. So let's get started in earnest here. I know many of you have seen this slide before. Um, I'm just going to provide just a really high level overview of the requirements just um, to kind of give us all a little bit of context and make sure we start from the same page. Um, I know there's a lot of familiar, faith, familiar names and faces today, but there's also several folks that are new. And um, we have covered this in detail in our newcomer series. And so I encourage you to um, take a look at that. And let me just drop the link there for you to our YouTube channel. Um, we go through the process in detail, so you can check all of those things there. Okay, so before I talk specifically about the stuff on the slide, I have to say I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Okay. Uh, in California, local governments are allowed to amend the state building code provided they follow certain rules. Um, and those rules apply to the entire code. Rules you have to document what are referred to as findings, and that's basically the rationale for why the ordinance is necessary. You have to follow all the proper processes. The amendments have to comply with the state code. They can't be less stringent. You can't adopt an amendment that allows people to not meet the state code. They have to actually be more stringent than the state code. And importantly, you have to update the amendment as well as the building codes every new building code cycle. And of course, follow all of the appropriate filing and posting processes. Um, in addition to these requirements, the energy code actually has uh, a few additional requirements. Um, in, if you're going to amend the energy code, the amendment has to be cost effective. It can't preempt federal regulations. And this is the EPCA CRA Berkeley issue, which I think we've all talked about um, extensively. So I'm not going to go into that here. But you can't preempt the federal regulations. And again, the code has to be more stringent than the state code. The amendment has to actually result in energy savings. You can't, again, uh, adopt an amendment that would allow people to use more energy than the state code. Um, I have a link here to a CBSC resource, uh, the Building Standards Commission resource. It's called the Guide for Local Amendments of Building Standards. This lays out the requirements for submitting your package in detail and where you submit them and everything. I find this very, very helpful. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that and download that when you have an opportunity. Okay. So why do we do the studies? Well, the studies really are a way of telling us how much we can reasonably exceed the code in each region while still meeting the other requirements for cost effectiveness and not preempting the federal government. Um, as I noted, there are required component in your CEC submittal packages. But in addition, they also provide some information for you that you need to communicate the costs and the impact of the proposed policies with both your colleagues and your ex external stakeholders. Um, and that's important, irrespective of whether it's actually legally required. Um, it's still important to understand what your what the costs are and the impacts on any proposed policy. Um, so the studies really define kind of the outside edge of the cost effective envelope, and we use those results as guidance to help determine what works best in each jurisdiction. 
Um, our studies are most commonly much like this one. They support building efficiency and decarbonization, but we also do other studies. Um, we have water efficiency studies. We did a study on pool heating equipment. Um, we also have some other studies. We uh, did a little bit of work on controlled environment horticulture and things like that. So, um, like I said, while they're mostly on building and decarbonization, we also cover other topics. Okay, so looking at this study in particular, our existing single family study, um, the market and, and the field is changing really rapidly, um, so fast that in this cycle, we've actually had to produce two versions of almost all of our studies. Um, the initial version had to be updated in almost all cases because so many things have changed. Um, for this study, there's been changes in almost all of the key inputs. Um, there's new utility rates and tariffs, the measure and equipment costs have changed, and we've added, we've expanded the measures to show several different options and different existing conditions. Um, for example, one, one new option that we show is for heat pump or for water heating. Um, we have both a natural gas existing water heater and an electric resistance existing water heater. So you can see the impact of replacing either one. So um, we've expanded it pretty tremendously. And um, that results in a pretty comprehensive and again, complex study. Um, as it's structured now, it can support several different types of ordinances. Um, and that was the intent of the study is to be as flexible as possible. So it could support an ordinance that requires a specific measure, such as possibly PV or pool roofs or maybe duct sealing or something like that. Um, it also could support, can support a, a performance-based ordinance, something like the flexible compliance path, which gives more options for how to comply. And it will support also an equipment replacement policy. So there's a lot of information in this study. And like I said, we're going to be spoke, focusing mostly on the flexible path today. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Ada to get us started looking at the updates and the rationale for those changes in the study. Ada? Thanks, Misty. So first wanted to just set the stage um, and provide some background for what we changed here in this study um, and the reason for those updates. So a few of those, um, so a few of those reasons. One is um, with recent events, as many of you may be familiar with the Berkeley ruling, there is a move away from an all electric ordinance and a need to provide multiple pathways to comply and be extra mindful of preemption. And like Misty said, that we can't promise that this is FGA safe and we're not lawyers. Um, I think we've done our, our very best um, to provide some of that background. And um, so the other piece is uh, as the market continues to shift and technology develops, we also saw a need to get a current pulse on the feasibility and cost effectiveness of measures. So there's many factors that impact costs, including cost of equipment, policy changes that impact costs and utility costs. So we wanted to update um, our cost analysis as well. So a quick overview of some of these changes. First, um, to address that changing market, we updated our costs through a contractor survey. The goal was to try to capture the actual installed cost of various measures, including HVAC, plumbing, envelope, and air sealing, and PV installations. So we'll get into that a little bit more. We'll provide some more details in, a, in the following slide. Uh, we also provided a sensitivity analysis for utility tariff escalation. So for those who aren't familiar, utility rates increase every year. And there are currently some different ideas of how the gas and electricity market will change over the next 30 years and the resulting impact on the utility tariff escalation. So the primary results in our report um, and as well as in this presentation will be based on the CPUC 2022 TDV escalation scenario, but sensitivity analysis was also done um, to and performed with the 2025 LSE escalation assumption. And uh, we'll also, I'll also talk more about that uh, in a little bit more detail um, later. Next is another update is uh, using NBT in this analysis. So NBT is the utility rate for homes with PV. 
And so when homes generate more PV than they use, they sell it back to the grid or utility at a set rate. So the biggest change with NBT is that the rate of electricity for, from PV um, that's purchased is less than the previous NEM 2.0. So the result is that PV measures don't provide as much of a cost-effective benefit as it had in the past. Uh, we also updated the um, software to use the 2025 version of CBEC res instead of 2022 in order to take advantage of some updated weather files and metrics. So site energy results are similar between CBEC res 2022 and 2025, but the 2025 compliance metrics applies uh, assumptions relative, uh, reflective of a electrified future. Um, such as high escalation for natural gas retail rates and favors electric buildings. In addition, the 2025, um, in 2025, some of the weather stations were changed for climate zones four and six from San Jose to Paso Robles and um, Torrance to Los Angeles International Airport, respectively. We also updated utility rates as we typically do for these studies. And we added some more scenarios, so ductless HVAC scenarios and heat pump water heater tank location scenarios. So next slide, um, we have, so to get, just provide a little bit more detail for the contractor surveys, um, to reiterate, the goal was to capture that current pricing for HVAC, plumbing, envelope, air sealing, PV installations. We did this by leveraging existing relationships with contractors and performed it in the summer of 2023. Some key takeaways were that the costs for this analysis are higher compared to previous studies. So um, a huge driver of this analysis was actually because we heard from people that as they actually went out to bid, the prices that they were receiving were higher than what was reported in our previous studies. And so um, we did, so that was a huge reason why we wanted to contact these contractors and see what people would actually be experiencing. And so these costs aren't necessarily like the best case scenario, but it's more of um, the typical scenario. That's what we were trying to capture. And um, so in another takeaway is that, yeah, I think maybe this is obvious, but there's a lot of factors that can impact costs. So. We tried to really capture that in this study, asking contractors many details to capture different existing scenarios, including yeah, the location of water heaters, if the uh, system, the existing system was gas versus electric, uh, if systems are ducted, ductless. So to try to uh, provide some of that specificity and all of that adds to different, different impacts on the costs. So. Yeah, so that's a quick summary of some of our takeaways for the contractor survey. Um, next, I want to provide some background for our methodology. So this isn't this isn't necessarily all new updates for those who are familiar, um, but wanted to provide this as context for the uh, rest of our presentation here. So to determine cost effectiveness, we modeled a 1665 square foot existing prototype with the following characteristics and um, assumed a individual space conditioning and water heating systems, one per single family building, a split system air conditioner with natural gas furnace, small storage, natural gas water heater, gas cooktop oven and closed dryer, and, um, and evaluated three different vintages. So homes built before 1978, homes within 1978, 1991, and 1992 to 2010. So the building characteristics for each vintage were determined based on either the building efficiency requirements in effect or standard construction practices during that time period. Next, there's two cost effective, uh, yeah, methodologies to evaluate cost effectiveness that we use in these reports. One is on-bill cost effectiveness, and that's based on utility data, and it's essentially the cost effectiveness from the customer's point of view. So utility rates are applied based on the predominant utility served serving that zone with some zones evaluated with multiple utilities where service territories cross over. And cost effectiveness is over 30 years. So given a certain year, a utility rate is applied, but utility rates increase every year. And the magnitude um, or how much it increases every year, we call that the escalation rate. And so there's different assumptions 
for what that um, what that rate should be. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but just wanted to prime everyone. Uh, so the second metric is LSC, and this is the long-term cost of operating California's energy system. This is also across 30 years. And so where on bill is intended to reflect more of the perspective from the customer, LSC reflects the impacts of investment across the entire energy system in California. And we'll be presenting um, results in net present value or NPV, which is the present value of the benefit minus present value of the cost. So for the escalation rates, wanted to um, try to paint that picture of what these escalation rates are because it can be kind of hard to, um, to grasp. So um, just to reorient us a little bit on the x-axis is the year and the y-axis is the escalation rate or the percent increase in the utility rate that year. Um, in the, the lines with the triangles, are the gas escalation rates and the lines with the dots are the electricity escalation rates. So the main point of this graph is how the gas, so um, the ones with the triangles, the gas escalation rates diverge between um, that purple line, which is the 2025 LSE assumptions and the blue line is the 2022 TDV assumptions. So for just a high level, um, yeah, just kind of a big picture. 2025 LSE escalation rates have a pretty aggressive assumption about the future of fuel choice moving towards all electric and a steep increase in gas prices. So you'll notice that like 15 year period where the gas prices are assumed to increase 8% every year and versus the 2022 escalation rate, um, you know, assumes something very different. So that's that's a quick intro about some of the changes that's for this, cool. yeah, this analysis. Okay, thank you very much, Ada. Um, just a quick question for you on the escalation rates. These look very, very different. Um, which one's the right answer? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, we all want to know which one's the right answer and. Um, unfortunately, we're not here to, it's hard to predict the future. And so, uh, yeah, we don't know is the short answer, but we, the purpose of this um, study is to provide sort of a range. So there's, um, yeah, so there's that aggressive assumption about where the utility rates are going to be um, and yeah, really high gas rates and then yeah another uh, another range and I think the right answer is probably somewhere in the middle um, but we want to provide that context so you can uh, in Jasmine will talk about it in the cost effectiveness explorer but you can toggle between the two values because we've, we've uh, provided the results with both the full set of results with both of these escalation rate assumptions so you can see how that um, these rates will impact the results. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in some following slides too, about some of these differences. Okay, thank you, thank you. So really, I guess something to keep in mind is these are both forecasts and, and, and they're kind of our best guess. Or yeah, our, yeah, that's a good way to say it. <laughs> right. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a quick poll that I would like to um, ask the attendees just a couple of quick questions. If you just give me one second to get this uh, set. If you guys uh, wouldn't mind, we wanted to just ask you a couple of quick questions before we move on to Jasmine's presentation. Go ahead and fill that out. I'd appreciate it. You all able to see the questions? If you look in your chat, there's a, a link. You can see the question and then it says view poll. Um, it should have popped up on your screen. Michael, uh, it says your version of Teams isn't allowing you to answer. Um, 
Ooh. Misty, same here. It's saying that um, there's a problem reaching the app, so I don't think the poll is going to be functioning. I apologize. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just go ahead and close it. Um, I I have to apologize to everybody. I swear I tested this over and over again. Um, <laughs> um, I apologize. Uh, basically, we were going to try to check and maybe we could get, uh, I did get a couple of folks answering it looks like. Uh, but not too many were able. Misty, if you want, we can all raise our hands if we're going to. That's what I was that. going to ask. Thank you very much. Is that Claudia? Uh, oh, that's that Cora. Cora. I'm sorry. I saw just the CPA. There's two. <laughs> Thank you, Cora. The first question is, is, is your jurisdiction planning to adopt an ordinance for existing single family homes before the 2025 code cycle? Could you just raise your hand if you're if you uh, have that one. And uh, the raise hand is up at the, usually up at the top of the screen. Okay. No one's planning to adopt before the 2025, okay. And are you planning to adopt an ordinance but waiting until after the 2025 code cycle? Again, if you could raise your hand if that's, uh, Case. Okay, we have a couple of jurisdictions that are doing that. Great, thank you very much, and thanks for that suggestion again, Cora. <laughs> and again, I really did test this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine is going to give us a quick overview of the Explorer. Jasmine, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. So let me share. The Explorer screen. Make sure. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. Beautiful. So if you have room on your screen at home and you want to follow along, feel free to open a window and just type in explore.localenergycodes.com. Um, this is going to take you to our landing page. If you've never been here before, the sidebar on the left gives you a quick overview of what we do. Um, we have building estimates, study results, policy options, which are templates for you. And then you can save your policies if you have an account as well and come back to them later. So to start with, we're gonna dive into study results and then we'll visit policies and policy options later. So if you're looking for all of this data that Ada has been talking about, you're gonna click right into study results. And then if you haven't come to the Explorer before, you will be prompted to type in your city. So go ahead and plug it in. We have all jurisdictions in California. So this will automatically pull up the results. I'm here in existing buildings for the existing building study. You can see the prototype here for single family. And just in case you wanna double check, you can always look here for the study source and release date to make sure you're looking at the right version. Um, so, get started, I'll open this. You can see that they're organized by vintage as well. So if we look at pre-1978, um, you can see the two different cost effectiveness methodologies that Ada mentioned here, on bill and LSC. Um, and you'll notice that we have two different on bill metrics here. We have one representing the 2022 escalation rates and one with 2025. So if you wanna get a feel for how those differences that Ada explained are affecting the cost effectiveness, this is a really great way to compare and take a quick look. Um, and then we also have this new LSC metric. Um, if you're ever confused about a term on the site, when you hover over them, you'll usually see these blue eye icons. You can click on them and it'll open up a brief summary um, with some details. And then you can also always click in this bottom blue corner it will open up. We have help articles. My face is right there and you can also send me a message and I'll get back to you um, or we can do a walkthrough as well. So those are all options. Um, beyond this, you can scroll further to the right and you'll see some of the other data that you'll find in the study, incremental cost, annual bill savings. Um, we have quite a bit more as well. And you can see here for annual bill savings, we have this orange dot. And if you see the orange dot anywhere on our site, it's a kind of a warning that you should pause, hover over it and take a look. Um, so this is just saying that for annual bill savings, and this is also true for life cycle savings, 
that the values that we're showing, because we only have one column currently, are based on the 2025 escalation rates. So if you're looking at that and like, mm, I think I want to use 2022, the link right here will take you to a workbook where you can download all of the results from the study and then filter from there. Um, you also might notice that the Explorer doesn't show all of the measures that Ada mentioned, like some of the newer ones. Um, we've kind of streamlined the most basic measures. So you can also download that data set if you want to really dive into like the different heat pump water heater location details. And that's most of the things on results. Um, the main purpose of the study results page is if you want a quick overview of what's included in the study, if you know, for instance, that you really want to dial in and look at one measure in the pre-1978 vintage, it's easy to pull it up and take a look. Um, and after Ada comes back and talks some more, we'll switch back to me and then we'll go into actually developing a policy on the Explorer, which allows you to take these results and actually develop a policy with them that is saved and that will kind of sum the impacts and give you some resources with those. And that's about it for now for me. All right, that's great. Thank you, Jasmine. I have a quick question for you. If I um, was looking at this, what if I wanted to just look at, like I just wanted to see the on-bill results and the flexible score, like right next to it so that I could easily compare. Is there a way to do that? Yes, definitely. Um, so if you look up here in the upper right-hand corner of the card, you'll see add and hide columns. You can click this and you can go through and select or deselect whichever columns you want. So for instance, if we want on bill right next to the flexible score, we can do that right there. Um, and we could also add in, you know, if you wanna look at the energy savings and flexible score to really dial in and um, understand that relationship, you can also do that right there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate that. No problem. A couple questions for our attendees now too. Have, have any of you ever used the Explorer before this webinar? And we're going to do a show of hands again because no polls. <laughs> okay, fabulous. It looks like a pretty pretty good mix of you guys have used it. Um, if you answered yes, have you? How have you used it? Have you used it to create a policy? couple of people. Okay. And I suspect the others, the rest of you folks, have you used it just to view the study results? Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. So we have a few folks that are familiar with the Explorer. I hope this is uh, our, especially our next session where Jasmine walks through creating a policy it will be helpful for everybody. Okay, now we're going to go back to Ada, and Ada's going to dive into the results of our study in a little bit more detail now. Let me get this uh, back up on the screen. All righty, whenever you're ready, Ada. Sure, thanks. So you can move to the next slide. Um, here are the cost effectiveness results for duct and envelope. We'll start with duct and envelope measures. To orient us to this graph, this is a graph, or not graph, a figure of California and the 16 climate zones. So green is cost effective on bill and LSE. Yellow is only LSE cost effective. Orange is only on bill cost effective. And red is not cost effective in either. So um, some areas where we evaluate two utilities, there's an asterisk next to the numbers. So for example, SMUD is 12 with an asterisk. It's kind of hard to see here, but in our report, it, it also appears this way. Um, also wanted to just remind us that for these graphs or um, figures, it's the 20, we use the 2022 TDV escalation rates. And um, for this presentation, the envelope and duct measures will be presenting it with the pre-1978 vintage, um, but whereas the equipment replacement measures, so like heat pumps, will be using the 1992 to 2020, 2010 vintage. Um, the reason for this is because for envelope duct measures, it's often um, 
like large retrofits, which is more likely to happen with an older home. In addition, some of these envelope measures only apply to older vintages, um, whereas the uh, equipment replacement, we decide to use the newest vintage because it's the most conservative results. And um, yeah, newest vintage would definitely have someone could replace their AC. So, so that's just a little bit of orientation here. Uh, so on the left, we have duct ceiling to 10%. So uh, we can see here is that in many older homes, um, they have a leaky duct system. So that should be replaced when they reach the end of life, which is typically 20 to 30 years. But if the duct system does still have remaining life, it should be sealed and tested to 10% leakage or lower. And it's cost effective in many of those climate zones. Uh, in the middle, we have R13 wall insulation. You can see that it's cost effective in many uh, areas for older homes as well. And um, this is for uninsulated walls. On the right is R49 attic insulation. So this is interesting. What you'll notice in um, the milder climate zones along the coast, the attic insulation is not cost effective, especially around that uh, around the Bay Area. But as you move inland, R49 insulation can be a good cost effective option. Next, we have water heating results. Hey, Ada, so, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Fred has his hand up. Fred, do you have a question oh, yeah. or was your hand up from the from the poll earlier? Oh, my hands apologies. Down. That was my no, hand. No worries. Just wanted to make sure we got your question poll. answered if you had yeah. one. Thanks. All right. Back to you, Ada. Thanks, Alia. Yeah. So for the next slide, I think you can move on. Water heating. Yeah, so just a reminder, these are the newest vintage. And um, so on the left is the 240 volt federal minimum heat pump water heater. And so this is, so heat pump water heaters are federally regulated uh, or water heating is a federally regulated appliance, which means that an ordinance can't require something higher than this. And though heat pump water heaters on the market are more efficient than this federal minimum heat pump water heater, an ordinance must prove that using this heat pump water heater is um, a cost effective uh, and a path to compliance. So that's the reason why we have um, this measure is important for this um, analysis. And you'll notice that it's LSE cost effective everywhere, um, but only on bill in the SMUD territory. Uh, in the middle is a in, is a measure of interest uh, using a 120 volt NIA rated heat pump water heater. And uh, this is of interest because it can be easily installed and plugged in to a standard outlet. And you'll notice that it's LSE cost effective everywhere and on bill cost effective in a couple. And the last one to the right is that federal minimum heat pump water heater in combination with three kilowatt PV. So there's a benefit in offsetting some of that additional electricity with PV. Uh, but you also notice with people, maybe for those of you who are familiar with the previous reports, um, with the net, uh, with NBT tariff, there's a reduced rate for selling your PV back to the grid compared to NEM 2.0. So the impact of PV is less um, and not as able to flip those climate zones to be cost effective on bill for many of these climate zones. So, um, so we noticed the impact of, of that tariff change as well. Next, we have some heat pump space heating measures. On the left is a dual fuel heat pump with an existing furnace. So this is the scenario where an AC goes out and you install a heat pump, but maybe there's still life on your furnace. So you can use that furnace for backup heating. So that's that scenario. Middle is just a heat pump space heater. And on the right is that same heat pump space heater with three kilowatt PV combined. So you'll notice that in Southern California, especially in say like climate zone 15, which is like the hot desert, there's little to no heating load. So switching from a heat pump space heater doesn't provide that, uh, switching to a heat pump space heater doesn't provide enough benefit from switching from a gas furnace to a heat pump. But there 
um, is still that symbiotic relationship between a heat pump space heater and a PV. So um, the PV can offset some of that additional electricity costs and make the package cost effective in many of those areas. So where cost effectiveness is one way to evaluate a measure, um, there's another important perspective, which is the first year utility impacts. So I wanted to show some of those results here. So this is a first year utility impact. Um, basically, if this value is negative, it means the resident will pay more in this coming year after implementing the, the measure. So this is all for one climate zone, climate zone 12. Um, but in blue, we have PG&E and orange is SMUD utility rates. So both PG&E and SMUD territory, they use the same PG&E gas rates, but SMUD has lower electricity rates than PG&E. So especially with these fuel switching measures, the electricity to gas um, ratio can have a significant impact on the savings or cost that the customer will see by switching from gas to heat pump. And so I think one lesson we can learn is that those electricity rate models can make um, the first year utility impact sa savings positive um, with structures like SMUD we can have a yeah, significant impact there. Next, I want to talk about um, escalation sensitivity analysis. So as I mentioned previously, we performed the utility rate escalation sensitivity analysis and we evaluated the entire suite of measures with both the 2022 TDV escalation scenario as well as the 2025 LSE escalation assumption. So um, don't get overwhelmed, but this graph here shows a sample of measures from Climate Zone 12 pg and &E. And um, just wanted to note that on the left are more of the equipment replacing on the right are um, um, on the while we're all here on the call, do you um, do you want to meet next week? And um, so just wanted to note that with e equipment replacement measures, um, oh yeah, that these equipment replacement measures are in the um, newest vintage, but the envelope ones are in the old oldest vintage. Um, and so especially with fuel switching measures, you can see that there can be a substantial difference in the cost effectiveness results due to that high es gas escalation rate um, and relatively low electricity escalation rates. But for envelope measures, the difference can be less drastic. So, um, but yeah, as Jasmine mentioned, you can take a look for your specific context, how, how those escalation rates can impact your climate zone. Uh, we also performed a, a, a sensitivity analysis for um, electric panel upgrades. So another question, so this question that we wanted to address was if we switch from a gas furnace, say to a heat pump space heater or a gas boiler to a heat pump water heater, um, and an electric panel upgrade is required, how will that impact the cost effectiveness results? So this here is um, just climate zone 12 PG&E. And uh, while our standard results don't assume uh, electric panel upgrade, we perform the sensitivity analysis to evaluate the cost effectiveness if an electric panel upgrade is required. And while there is an impact, you know, there's a pretty significant impact. In many cases, actually, it doesn't flip the cost effectiveness outcome, um, though it does in some. So if this is something of that you're, um, yeah, you're considering, definitely look at the explore for your context, but just wanted to provide just a, a little sample a snippet of what that might look like for one, one example. And lastly, just wanted to summarize some of the um, impacts and implications of this analysis um, and summarize some of the things that we talked about. So for envelopes, we recommend looking at many of the envelope measures so, um, because many of them are cost effective in the older vintages. Uh, and in addition to reducing utility costs, a lot of these measures provide many other benefits, including improving occupancy, comfort, and satisfaction, and increasing the home's ability to maintain temperature, especially during extreme weather events and power outages. So it adds that resilience to the home. Um, and for decks, 
yeah, many of those older homes have leaky systems that should be replaced at the end of life. But um, if the ducts still have remaining life, they should be sealed and tested to 10%. That's cost effective in many areas. Um, for a heat pump space heater, the dual fuel heat pump with the existing furnace was cost effective um, everywhere except for climb zone 15. And for the heat pump space heater, it was cost effective everywhere except for climb zone 8 and 15. So there are those challenges to on bill cost effectiveness due to the higher first cost and um, first year utility cost due to the higher electricity tariffs relative to gas tariffs, um, with the exception of SMUD and CPAU where there's lower um, lower costs there. Um, the other piece that we evaluated was ductless systems. Um, we evaluated ductless municipal heat pumps um, for homes with existing ductless systems. Um, and while this was only found to be cost effective on um, one metric for uh, climate zones one and 16, uh, ductless municipal Heat pump systems can, um, they have, oh, the reason for that is because they have like a high incremental cost because they're a more sophisticated system than their base um, system, which is that wall furnace or window AC unit. But uh, also wanted to note that these ductless mesoless heat pumps can provide greater comfort benefits if it's properly installed um, to directly condition all habitable spaces as is required under the VCHP compliance credit. Um, and so that can be another incentive for a homeowner to upgrade their system. For heat pump water heaters, um, there's that similar on-bill cost effectiveness challenge with the high first cost. Um, we also looked at, as you mentioned before, location of the heat pump water heaters, um, and it can have um, some impact, but it often doesn't flip the cost effectiveness outcome. And But there can be other factors outside of cost effectiveness to be considered. For heat pump water heaters in conditioned space, it can provide free cooling during the summer, um, reduce tank losses, shorter pipe lengths, but um, you also need to consider some other design consideration, including noise and comfort concerns and um, comfort uh, condensate removal should also be considered. Um, as well as ventilation. So, uh, and then for PV, um, yeah, like we talked about, there's less utility cost savings under NBT, and it favors on site utilization of PV generation. So, we didn't evaluate this in the study, but, um, but there could be some benefit in coupling PV with battery to take advantage of that um, improved on site utilization. So, um, yeah, and then as Misty mentioned earlier, so some of our next step is the AC to heat pump replacement. Uh, this analysis and presentation wasn't intending to focus on AC to heat pump replacements, um, but we are in the middle of some ongoing work to, um, yeah, just to adequately, adequately support this AC to heat pump ordinance. So some of that work includes additional research in the technical feasibility of the gas path, as well as providing adequate exceptions for site limitations and um, if it's unable to meet some of the performance specifications, as well as looking into income graduated fixed rate tariffs. So there's more coming um, down the line and we'll be eager to update you all when that is available. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ada. Um, okay, a lot of information there. I had a quick question. You mentioned that um, the PV is less cost effective with the NBT, but it looks like based on the maps that you were showing that it's really a pretty good pairing with heat pump systems, that the two of them together seem to do pretty well. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, and um, I, yeah, I meant it was less in previous studies, um, just by adding PV, it would almost flip everything to be cost effective everywhere uh, for on bill and LSE. But you're right, for this study, it still is a very good pairing with the heat pump, where uh, because the NBT um, favors on site utilization by being able to use more of that PV on site. Um, it is cost effective in a lot of areas. So that is a correct statement, yeah. Okay, yeah, so increasing that electricity load is is uh, helpful with the NBT tariff, trying to balance that right. out. Yeah. Great, thank right. you. 
Thanks. Okay, we're, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule. I'm going to just take a little bit of a break here and see before we start with Jasmine's last um, um, session here. Does anybody have any questions or comments that you'd like to share? There's one question that just came in in the chat about whether the updated version of this study is uploaded on the Cost Effectiveness Explorer site. So Jasmine, you're the best respond to that. It is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have it up. It's ready for you to use, to view, um, and to use in policy creation. So. And that is the correct April 2024 is correct. We finished the, the analysis earlier this year. Great. Hey, any other questions or comments? very quiet today or if there's you know because we do have a little bit of extra time if there's something that anyone was perhaps a little confused on or, or think that the group would benefit from a little more ex explanation or going back to a particular slide we're happy to take a couple minutes to do that And of course, if those things come up after this webinar, <laughs> you can always reach out to us. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. That's what always yep. happens to me. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a, a while to digest done. everything. It's understandable. It is. it is. It's a lot of information. And, and so it, it is. It's a bit hard to process, especially the first time through. I think all of us have gone through it about 25 times now, <laughs> at least. OK. OK. If there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and uh, go to Jasmine's next um, session, which is building a policy in the Explorer. And I'm going to stop sharing, Jasmine, and let you uh, take over the screen. Awesome. Let me pull the Explorer back up. And again, if you would like to follow along and you know, come out of this webinar with your own flexible path policy, feel free to do so. Uh, Misty, can you see my screen? I can. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so for this policy creation portion, we're going to move away from study results and we're going to go into policy options instead. So policy options are basically where we have a lot of policy templates that are pre formatted and just ready for you to use. Um, so here in existing buildings, you'll see we have three policy options. Uh, I'll start for the bottom. So we have this choose requirements later option, which is a blank slate. So we are not pre-filling out any requirements for you. It's just nothing there. Um, and then looking up here, we do have our flexible option, um, which we've given them longer titles so that if you aren't familiar with like the terms prescriptive and flexible, they should still be understandable. So here you're requiring a minimum energy savings with multiple paths to comply. And then we do have this basic prescriptive option where you're requiring specific cost-effective measures. So for this webinar, we're going to go through and choose the flexible option. So we'll click select over here, and then you can review which building types you want to include. So I'm going to say just single family and uncheck this. If you wanted to uncheck a specific climate zone, you can do that as well. And then I'm going to name my policy and create it. And then once it's generated, we'll go here and click see my policy. So this landing screen is just giving you an overview of how many climate zones you have and each of the vintages for the building type. So to open this and start really editing, you can click on any of the vintages. I'm just going to choose pre-1978 because that's the first one. Now for a little bit of layout with the screen, the left bar is a pretty new feature that we've added. So if you haven't been to the Explorer in a while, it may look new. Um, the idea here is that it's going to make navigating a lot easier and hopefully should give you more context when you're working on your policy. So here you'll see we're identifying that it's an existing building policy, that you have single family homes included. You can collapse them or reopen them. 
climate zone seven and all of the associated vintages, and then climate zone 10 and the associated vintages. So you'll see multifamily is in light gray along with everything below that because I chose not to add multifamily to my policy. If I wanted, I could click on this and then it will add it to my policy. If I decide I wanna delete something, I can hover over and then click the trash icon and it'll remove it from my policy. And a really easy way to tell which card you're in currently is that it's teal and bolded, so it should stand out a little. So we're in pre-1978 for Climate Zone 7 for single family. And then moving on to this sort of main part of the page, you can see up top we have these two main requirement settings, right? So you can require specific measures, or you can require a minimum flexible score, or both. So the minimum flexible score is already on because of the policy option I chose, which is the flexible one. Um, if I had chosen prescriptive, this one would be off and the prescriptive option would be on with measures added to it. So if you want to add measures, you can go through and you don't even have to toggle this on. You can just add them below and they'll show up on top with a toggle off. You can remove them there as well. And we have a couple concepts here for flexible scores. So we have the required flexible score, which is the score that you're going to set. You can use the arrows here to decrease or increase it, or you could type in directly and it'll adjust. Um, the maximum cost effective score is the recommended upper boundary for where you should be setting your flexible score. And if you click the eye icon here, just like the other eye icons I pointed out in results, it will give you some extra information. Is it? There we go. Okay. So the idea between behind flexible paths and this maximum score is that we are looking at all of the study data and looking at the cost effective measures within it and finding what mix of those is going to get you the greatest energy savings. So this should not be appearing twice, but the table is for now. So we'll just ignore the bottom one. It's the same thing. Um, but for this case, you can see that we found that solar PV was cost effective and has 16.3 MMBTU per year in energy savings. R49 attic insulation has 3.5 and the new ducts RE insulation and duct ceiling package has 2.5 MMBTU. So you can see the correlation here to meet this score. But then when we go back, you can see that your permit applicants have a much wider range of measures to choose from to meet that score. Um, so you can adjust that as needed. If you try and go over the maximum cost effective score, there will be a warning. So don't worry too much about that. Um, so then you can also, for note with the cost effective score, if you go through and let's recheck. So R49 attic insulation is one of the measures that is used to meet the score. If I was to go down and make this mandatory, you're gonna see the page change a little bit. So all of a sudden we have two maximum cost effective scores. One, which is using any flexible measures that is the same that we saw before. And now we have this new one that's using available flexible measures. And you can click this eye icon again, and it will update and show you that basically, if you've made this mandatory, people can't get points for it anymore voluntarily. So we're subtracting that from the maximum to make it a maximum out of what is available to them. Um, and the same thing will happen if, for instance, we went down and instead of making it mandatory, we removed it. And you can remove measures just by clicking right there on the little minus. And then you'll see that again, we have these two scores and it's affected that. Um, and if you wanna put those back in, you scroll to the bottom and there's a section called unavailable measures. And you can click this restore icon and it goes right back to how it was before. So other things that you can do here of note is we do have the calculation method um, it's automatically set right now to on-bill cost effectiveness using 2025 escalation rates. 
um, we do have the little orange dot there explaining the difference. So if you walk away from this webinar and forget why those two different escalation rates and which one you know means what, you can always hover over that. And we have an article learning more. Um, so if you need to dive into it more, and you can also click here and select another option. So if you want one that includes on build 2025 or LSC, you can do that. Um, or if you want to just use the on bill with 2022 escalation rates, you can select that one as well. And the other big thing we have here is we have this combined impact for all requirements row. So this row will update when you change either mandatory or available measures or when you change your required flexible score. And what is happening is our website is running through all of the different measures looking at their flexible scores and what combination will get you to, in this case, 15, your required flexible score, and calculating what is the least costly method up front to get there. So it's assuming that you know, your permit applicants are going to be primarily concerned with the cost um, when they're making this choice. And this will update as you go. And then you know if you're done here on pre-1978, you would move down then to 1978 to 1991 and do the same thing, just setting up um, for each vintage and each climate zone, your requirements. And then when you're done there, you can click done up here in the right hand corner and it'll take you back to this main overview page. And then the next interesting spot to go to is impacts up here. We'll give it a second. Um, and for saving your policies, if you are on the same browser and you have not like cleared your cache, it should still be able to bring you back to your policy, but we really recommend having an account and signing in because then, you know, if something happens, you can, or you have to access on another device, your policies will still be there. Um, let's see, loading very slowly. One moment, let me reload it. Perhaps not, let me retry. So just to show you, like for my policies over here is where I could click. And because I am on the same browser, it should remember my policy and pull it up for me. My internet may be causing issues. I am not, here we go. Okay, so here you can see my test policy. It's still here. If you've just created a policy without your account on, you can always click save and it'll walk you through creating an account and making sure it's there. Let me try reopening. There we go. And reopening impact and see if it will work for me this time. Okay, there we go. So the impact page is first and foremost this large chart right that's letting you look at all the building types you've added requirements to for all the climate zones for all of your vintages as a whole policy what is the impact um, citywide and we're looking at here there's several options of impact metrics that you could look at so by default it's choosing emissions reductions and then you can look at this on the chart I could also choose life cycle savings or electricity savings if that's what I'm really interested in as well. Um, if you want to dial in deeper, you can scroll down to this chart and then expand it. And it can expand back out to those individual requirements categories um, that we were working on earlier. One thing to note is on several of these policy pages and on the results page as well, we do have some pretty key assumptions that you can go in and edit. Um, so we have provided building estimates, but if you don't like them, if you have quick access to really good building estimates in your jurisdiction, you can update them yourself. We also have different sort of policy assumptions that can be edited by you. So your policy's effective date. So when is it going to start? How long is your policy going to last? What percentage of units do you think your policy will be affecting? Um, and other more complicated ones like 
what's your current grid clean electricity progress. So maybe your city has a CCA that is very progressive and you already have extremely clean electricity. Um, so you can pop that in here and we can go ahead and it will regenerate the emission savings based on that so that it's very customized to your jurisdiction. Um, and after that, you can always share this. So this link will then, be, if you want to send it to stakeholders, if you want to share it with a colleague, you can copy the link right there and then they can view the policy. Uh, they won't be able to edit the policy if it's shared, but they can always make a copy of it and go from there. And then we also have documents here ready to go. So we have a PDF for cost effectiveness evidence. This is basically just a download of the results page that applies to the type of policy that you've made. Um, so if I download this PDF, it will show me the results for single family units in both climate zones in Vista and for all of the vintages that were added to my policy. Um, the requirement summary is a little different. It'll produce a table showing which measures, in this case, the points for each measure in each vintage for both climate zones. Um, and then the requirements table is very similar, but it's um, a spreadsheet. So, sorry. Um, if you want to be able to copy and paste a table into a document, this is a great resource. And then we have a model ordinance page that it'll take you to where you can download model ordinances that uh, the Codes and Standards team has worked on, where you can just plug in your city's information and your policy requirements, and then use that to move forward. And I think that's it. Righty, thank you very much, Jasmine. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, if jurisdictions considering offering incentives, you know, we often ask, have put, uh, cities asking us about incentives and how they factor into the study. Um, if they're considering perhaps offering their own incentive to help help uh, promote a measure, um, can the explorer help them kind of figure out how to establish the right amount for that or an appropriate amount, maybe not the right amount? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so if I open back up the requirements, or you could do this from the results page, whichever is easiest, you can go up here to add hide columns and we have some subsidy columns available. So I'll scroll to the right to give you a better picture. But we have a couple subsidies that we're calculating. Um, the first is if a measure is not cost effective on bill, what would it take to make that measure cost effective? Um, so we have that listed out here. And then we also are calculating another subsidy that if a measure takes longer than five years to pay back, with the assumption that, that might be a big burden for a permit holder, that we can look at what would it take to make a measure pay back in five years? What subsidy would be required to make it have that faster payback time? Um, and we have these both for the care rate results as well, because those are provided in the study. So. Okay, so if you were thinking of perhaps helping, offering an incentive for income qualified permit applicants, for example, somebody that uh, maybe is on a care rate, Exactly. Um, you can see that. Oh, excellent. Okay, so this kind of gives you a little bit of a range of, of what these different incentive levels might do to each measure and how they might impact them. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, I uh, got just a couple of questions for you all. Uh, really easy ones, don't worry. Um, not, not as hard as for Jasmine and, and Ada. Um, just a quick question. Is your jurisdiction considering a flex path ordinance? If you could do the uh, hand raise again, I'd appreciate that. Okay. Couple of folks. Okay, and are you possibly considering uh, requirements at either HVAC or water heating replacement? In show of hands. Okay, so we have a couple jurisdictions that are potentially looking at these requirements right now. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, do we have any other questions from the group? Raise your hand or pop something in the chat is also another way. Easiest probably at this point to raise your hand. Okay. No other questions? Okay. Well, let's go ahead and go to our wrap up then. Um, okay, so the study and the flexible path are actually structured and specifically structured actually to provide as much flexibility to you as possible. Basically, we've tried to set things up so that we acknowledge that there is a, an amazing variety of existing site conditions and that the options are going to vary depending on a lot of different factors, um, not just the house, the homes, but also the political climate, the, the actual climate <laughs> um, and other things in it that may change how you structure an ordinance. So this uh, study and the flex path are actually set up to allow you to customize it to suit whatever your local needs are. Um, for example, we have some jurisdictions that use the flex path menu, but they only require that project applicants select one measure. They just they said, okay, any measure, you just have to select a measure from this list. That's one way that people have used it. Um, We've also had folks um, set all different kinds of triggers. We've seen a few different ways that, that people are setting the triggers for when the ordinance might be effective. Um, one jurisdiction we know of set their original trigger at um, projects that impacted 750 square feet of space or more. And what they've discovered is that they that's probably a little bit too high and they're looking at ramping that down a little bit. Um, so that they pick up a few more projects because they really weren't picking up very many projects that way. So they're going to be ramp ramping that down a bit. Um, the other thing that might impact how you set up a structure is the age of the homes in your in your town. Um, in some cities, the homes are mostly older homes that were built before the energy code. That's that pre-78 time frame. Um, they may or may not have wall insulation and attic insulation, things like that. Um, in other jurisdictions, they have a much larger percentage of newer homes that may not be subject to many of these measures. They may already have good insulation and windows and things like that. So there's you can you can limit the scope if you like. You've got mostly older homes, perhaps you limit the scope to just that. Um, there's there's all different kinds of ways you can structure this. Um, Jasmine mentioned folks that are on um, care rates. And so you can also structure things differently for homeowners that are resource constrained. Um, one way to do that is to set a lower target. Um, you could limit the requirement to specific measures. There's a couple of very low cost measures on the list and you could potentially limit it to those for, for those people that are income qualified. Um, one of the ways we'd suggested that, that that could be verified would be a care rate or something like that. Not you know, like a huge application or something. But um, there's really all different ways that you can structure this. You can you can require different measures. It's it's really um, set for that maximum flexibility for you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. So um, just wanted to let you know also, you are not alone. There's tons of help out here. Um, we offer all kinds of custom assistance. Uh, we will do custom technical support for you. That might include helping you draft language, uh, helping you prepare for a presentation, or if you know you just want to talk through some of the questions that you have, we also will do that. Um, Jasmine noted that she's available to walk through the Explorer or explain any of those questions you might have too. So um, we do operate a lot upon request, and so um, it never hurts to ask. I encourage you to ask. We may or may not be help, be able to help, but if we are able, we will. Um, I think Jasmine mentioned this also, but if you're the kind of person that really likes to get into the data, we do have the full um, set of source data with all of the results for every single measure on our website. And I've got the, the um, link for that in a subsequent slide for you. So you can download that data and play with it however you'd like. Um, 
And okay, of course, in addition to the study and the support for the study directly, um, we also have uh, model ordinance language. Um, we have a slide deck that you can use to kind of get you started with presentations. It's got some of the basic information and it's it's there for you to customize. The same with the model ordinance language. Um, we keep it pretty generic so that you can add your own logo and all those kinds of things. Um, we have other implementation materials, checklists and things like that as well. So um, there's all kinds of things out there for you. Really encourage you to, to check out our YouTube channel. We have a bunch of different videos on that channel, including what we call our newcomer series. There's five webinars there that walk through the process, that walk through cost effectiveness in detail, all kinds of things like that. So um, I highly recommend you check out the website. And like I said, give us a call. We also publish a newsletter every month. Um, that can help keep you informed on things. Um, and really just we have a, a pretty big suite of resources and there's also uh, many other folks out there that are available for support. So really you're not alone and really we encourage you to reach out anytime. Um, we are here to help and happy to do so. <laughs>